Have you ever had a job you... <laughs> that didn't work. <clears throat> have you ever had a job you hated? I mean, really hated? Are you in it now? Well, in today's episode, we're going to talk about how to leave a job you hate using the power of a great network. Welcome to the World Changer Show with Matt McWilliams. I'm your host, Mark Sievercrop, a world changer just like you and Matt. On each show, we're going to bring you an inspiring person or message to help you unleash the world changer inside of you and live with passion, lead with purpose, and leave a legacy. Thanks for joining us today. Now let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome back to the World Changer Show. You are listening to episode 93 this week. And as always, you can find the links to everything we talk about today, including the unedited video cast of the interview on the show notes page at mattmcwilliams.com forward slash 093. Now, as you may know or may not know, we just passed the one year anniversary of the World Changer Show. That's right, episode one went live on September 15th, 2014, and what a ride it has been. Matt and I want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for listening and for your support. This show is about you. You are the world changer, and you inspire us through how you are changing the world. Now, today's show is going to be a little bit different. As you may have noticed, Matt was not on the beginning of this episode. Matt is actually taking a brief sabbatical from the podcast. He, he's focusing on projects with our business clients. That's right. He left me the keys of the show. Scary, huh? So to celebrate our year anniversary, we're bringing back some of the, the, our favorite episodes from the last, past year and actually some of your favorite episodes. But don't worry. We're still going to have some new episodes. We're going to mix them up. And we're going to be playing some of the hits because, I mean, 80% of our listeners, listeners are to the show. show. So over the next few so weeks, we're going to sprinkle in, in some new episodes, some new episodes and some old episodes. episodes. And today, we're going to start by sharing the third most popular episode that we have had. That's right. Out of 93 episodes, this is the number three most downloaded episode, which ironically, and this is a little weird, was when Matt interviewed me on leaving a job you hate and the power of a great network. So take a listen to this interview, and after the interview, we're going to announce the winner of the Shannon Kaiser book giveaway from episode 92, as well as announcing a new book giveaway that ties in pretty well to what Matt and I talk about today. Enjoy this interview with, well, me. All right, World Changers, I am honored to chat today with a fellow World Changer, Mark Sievercroft. Mark is a podcaster, he's a blogger, author, entrepreneur, connector, leader, consultant, and speaker. That's a really long list that Mark gave me today to read, uh, but most importantly, he's a friend of mine, and he's also the author of Project Success, which at one point right after it launched, climbed to the number three position in the self-help category in the uh, Amazon Kindle store, which is quite an accomplishment for somebody that's you know not a famous author. He's also the co-host of the Happen to Your Career podcast, which was a new and noteworthy podcast in the career section of iTunes. He is passionate about connecting with others, finding ways to add value to them, and helping other people to do the same. So make a note right now, after you listen, while you're listening, or go ahead and do it right now, Visit Mark's show notes page for links to his site and everything we might talk about today at mattmcwilliams.com forward slash 033. Mark, I'm exhausted after that introduction, but welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much. You did. I forgot to tell you to mention also, I was president of my fifth grade class. So You were. I don't know if we need to throw that in there as well. All right. So I've got to give a warning, warning to, the, <laughs> to the listeners today. This is going to be the hardest interview I ever do because... Mark, I've got to tell a little bit of the backstory here. Yeah. Mark and I are friends, which is, which is crazy. I think to both of us, we we, we like it, it, we don't really remember the point we happen? decided yeah. to be friends. Yeah, and uh, but it really is the power of 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 networking. And you know, one of the things that that John Corcoran and I talk about in an episode, actually the episode prior to this, episode thirty one, 
is uh, is kind of about you know about that how you and I became friends because we participated on the same blog together and we responded to each other's comments and we were helping each other more than anything mm -hmm. you know we were just we were just being of use to each other and saying hey I know how to help you with that problem and then we took it from the blog comments to the email and from the email to chatting you know on instant messenger from instant messenger to phone calls and and now we talk quite frequently and so I want to give that backstory to say that Mark and I have very similar personalities, and that is it's really hard for us to go about more than 30 seconds <laughs> without making a snide comment about the other. Right. You know, we're typical guys. Right. We're going to make fun of each other. And uh, and I also just want to point out that, yes, Mark does live in a tree and make cookies <laughs> like a Keebler elf. I give him give him crap about that all the time. So. Um, yeah, but Mark, welcome to the show. I just wanted to give I wanted to give the listeners a warning. <laughs> we have no idea which direction this show is None. going. We're gonna try to keep it focused, but you know what? Sometimes you gotta just laugh and and have fun with right. life. Right? Yeah, that will probably happen. Just a little bit. But Mark, let's talk. Let's talk about you. I love that's how we always start well, every interview. If you insist. <laughs> Aside of of being president of your fifth grade class, yeah. and con congratulations on that. Yeah, by it the was way. a hard fought election. Yeah. My, friend, my friends were my bodyguards the entire year. It was great. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but let's get right into your story. Tell us about you and why you're a world changer in your own words. Well, I, uh, you know, you mentioned a little bit of it. I mean, that, that list, as you, you mentioned, it just blows my mind because, you know, two years ago, I really had done nothing online. I was following a couple of blogs and, um, you know, to me, the only reason that if I could call myself a world changer is just because I've taken action and done some stuff. And, you know, Matt, you've been there for quite a bit of it, and it's a matter of, I don't know. I don't even know how I did it, really. It's just, I, I think when we see something we want, and then we just start taking action, we instantly become a world changer, even if it's our own world. You know, I really don't feel like I've really made that big of an impact in very many people's lives, but um, I know I've made an impact in my own life. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, as I've been listening to your show and uh, reading your blog, that's that's one of the most important worlds you could change is your own world and the things that you're doing. So, um, you know, I, I grew up on a farm. I um, always, for some reason, knew I was going to be successful or rich. I guess when I was young, that meant, you know, money. Obviously, when you're 16, being rich means you have a nice car and a nice house and all that fun stuff. But I always had that feeling. And, and looking back now, I never realized it. But my parents, uh, my dad's a farmer and a rancher, so uh, he, he is his own boss, and he, he works for himself. And and um, seeing that type of uh, freedom of schedule um, really cemented in me that same desire to uh, be able to determine what I was going to do. And, and um, you know, grew up in a good home, and they encouraged me and helped me along. And, and um, it, it's been a challenge for me, though. It's been a challenge to take that from – the idea stage of knowing what I wanted and actually take steps to move towards it. And I think that's when, when I really started to make a difference in my world was when I started taking, taking those steps and, and doing those things. So now, you know, like you said, I, I blog, I have a podcast or two or three that I've done. Um, I, I've done a lot of <laughs> podcasting actually, now that I think about it. Um, you know, I've, I've wrote a book, which I never thought I would do. And, and it's all just a matter of, you know, one thing led to another. You know, I, I really, when you say, how are you a world changer? I don't feel like one a lot of times, but, um, I certainly have changed my world and, and, uh, and, uh, look forward to continuing to do so. Well, Mark, you mentioned two things that I think, you know, that I really took away from what you just said. You, t you said that when we start taking action, we instantly change the world. And I, I really, I think of that in terms of of like the butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. You know, the, we, most people know what that is by now. But if a butterfly flaps its wings in Japan, it can cause a tsunami or a hurricane in the Atlantic. You know, and and I think about that when we when we just decide we're going to do something. And so for you, it was, you know, what I want to know more about leadership. I want to know more about career advancement. I want to know more about being a, a better professional. You know, whatever I'm doing. And you just started. Like you said, you just started following blogs. That was your start. Mm -hmm. That was your first action was, okay, I've got to do something. I've got to educate myself. Sometimes it's just, like you said, it's just educating yourself. And who, who would have thought that educating yourself would lead to starting a blog, would lead to starting multiple podcasts, would lead to 
you know, developing a friendship with someone as amazing as me. You know, I mean, who would have? Uh, <laughs> mm. <laughs> so I couldn't keep a straight mm. face and say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. Um, you know, who would have thought that? And who would have thought that you would have developed many of the relationships that you have today just from that one simple start? But sometimes it is that simple. You just you do that one thing and you wake up to what's it been for, for us, you know, almost two and a half years, I guess. Yeah. You wake up two and a half years later and you're like, how did I get here? Yeah. So I, that was that was one big takeaway that I got. And the second one was you mentioned, you know, just your dad, you know, observing your your parents and. Uh, that reminds me a lot of um, episode 23 with Chandler Bolt. And he talked about the same thing. Actually, it's been a recurring theme with many of the guests is they just observed their parents and went, wow, that's cool. I want to do that too, mm-hmm. but maybe take it to that next level. You know, so they had the freedom to do what they want when they want, but they wanted to do what they want when they want with, uh, you know, at an earlier age or they wanted to, you know, do these different things that we always want to go to that. Just, you know, just take that next step from our parents. And it sounds very similar. I just think that's a recurring theme. And to the parents out there, you know, you've, you've heard this phrase so many times, more is caught than taught, but just think about what you're doing and what your kids are seeing. And is that what you want them to strive towards? And if not, how can you start doing the things that you want them to strive towards? That's scary when you put it that way. Thanks for that. I'm like terrified to be a dad the rest of the day. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> that's that's my mission in life, Mark, is to make your life difficult. Make me terrified. <laughs> yeah. Oh, poor guy. You're going to be looking know. over your shoulder like, is one of my kids watching now? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I don't have to worry about that. My daughter usually makes sure that I know that she's watching. Dad, why did you do that? <laughs> dad, what are you doing? Why are you doing that, Dad? So... I love that. No, it's so true. I mean, I, I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're you're absolutely right. It's I mean, we always hear that, you know, the most important work you do is within the walls of your own home, but I mean, that really is why because that's kids' first example of what, you know, changing the world is like or not changing the world. Um or changing it in a bad way, I suppose, but um yeah, it's it's huge and I I never realized that growing up and you know, it took me um being 2000 miles away on my mission before I was able to admit all the things that my dad taught me. And, um, you know, thankfully for me, I admitted that to a bunch of people that I had only known for a couple months where I was at, and I didn't have to admit it to my dad to his face (laughs) because I'm sure he would have (laughs) laughed and said I told you so. But, yeah, you know, I I look back now, and and it it makes such a huge impact, even the small little things like that where, you know, my dad works harder than anybody I know. I mean, he's a farmer, but he still had control of his schedule and he still made it to things that I was doing. You know, he, he made up for it by working harder the next day. But, um, you know, that really, really did impact me. Um, that freedom of schedule, you know, knowing you have to think, get things done, but you can arrange how that gets done. If there's something important that you want to make it to, you know, that, that reminds me, I mean, I, I consider myself a hard worker. That's just the, that's the label I've given myself since I grew up playing golf. We won't, we won't debate that here. (laughs) Carry on. Thanks. Carry on. <laughs> but, you know, that's that's the the mindset that I've always had is I'm going to I'm going to outwork you. Like you may beat me and I may not win in the end, but I'm going to be every day I'm going to be getting closer to your level, regardless of what level that is. You know, in golf, that was my, my thing is like, okay, you're beating me now, but I'm getting closer to you and eventually I will pass you. And and I've applied that even in my entrepreneurial ventures, but at the same time, just like you said, you know, when, when my f- wife and daughter call me at 11 o'clock in the morning and say, you know, when she says, Daddy, will you come to the zoo? Assuming that I don't have anything that is truly pressing, the answer is yes. Now, I might work until 1 o'clock that morning, <laughs> but I was there with my daughter at the zoo. And, you know, she's not – like, I know for me, I'm not really going to remember how tired I was working until 1 o'clock in the morning to get my stuff done. But I am going to remember spending four hours with my family at the zoo in the middle of the day. Mm-hmm. And the reality is, you know, so many people, I think they spend their best hours. They spend their best time, their best mental resources. They spend them on things that they don't want to be doing rather than things that they do want to be doing. And I think that's backwards. It's not about not working hard because clearly I'm working till one o'clock in the morning. But it's about spending that time when I when I best want to. And it sounds like your dad was the same. Like he. Yeah, he worked, and he showed you that work, but he still got to be there for for your stuff. Yeah, yeah, and he wasn't at everything, but 
you know, he made it to quite a bit of stuff, and, and, you know, it was the same thing. I mean, it meant that, you know, I didn't see him that night sometimes because he'd go back to work, and he'd be working all night. And, you know, being a farmer, I mean, there was literally weeks where I didn't see my dad except for Sunday. I mean, he was up before I got up for school. He was in, he came home after I was in bed at night. I mean, it was just, it was crazy, but you know, when I had, when I had soccer games or when I had, um, something big going on, he was, he was there, um, probably 75% of the time, a lot, awesome. a lot more than a lot of parents. And it wasn't because he worked hard or I think he worked harder than them, but he had that freedom of schedule and, you know, he was able to set his own priorities in a lot of ways. And that was just something that, that really impressed upon me as a young kid. Um, I don't want to farm, I'm not going to farm, but that same type of thing was impressive. You know, I hear I hear that so often from from so many of the guests. It's like they saw you know, Chandler Bolt's another good example. He saw his parents; they were in real estate. You know, and real estate again provides you that freedom, but you have to. You know, their, the hours can be crazy, mm-hmm. and sometimes you don't have the freedom. But you know, he saw his parents doing that, and he doesn't want to be a real estate agent. <laughs> but he want he wants what they had, but not necessarily how they got right. it. And it sounds like you're in the similar boat. Like you said, I don't want to be a farmer. Right. I respect farmers. I don't want to be one. Um, I want to eat their food, right? Exactly. <laughs> but I don't want to be one. But I do want the the stuff that he had. But uh, let's let's turn our attention. To, you know, we've you were fifth grade class president. Yes. That's obviously a, a success. And I mm-hmm. presume with you, Mark, that's got to be probably the it was the high point, the high the high point of oh, your yeah. life. Today. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the only thing that's <laughs> higher than that was when I married my wife. But other than that, that's pretty much the high point. Oh, I, you're I, just I not, that because it's true. I have yeah, that's right. I have not had anybody since follow me around, pretend they were my bodyguards, and call me Mr. President. So it's hard to beat that, really. <laughs> so I, you have, I, you like, mean, I don't you even know to go, where to go from there. You haven't trained your children to do that? No, I should. They call me, okay, they call me master. It's a little different. Okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Walking around in full body armor, I can just picture <laughs> Brooklyn and Cash doing that now. Yeah, you need to, you need to give them, train them. Give them to little that. toy guns. So they can give it, that's that's your directive little, after this interview is to little, train your children to be your pretend bodyguards, right. toy machine yourself, that's right. to give you a big head. That's, right. um, <laughs> that's how kids get screwed up. <laughs> speaking of parenting skills, listen to none of what we've talked about for the past minute. That's right. But beyond those those high points, you know, and, I, and we're going to talk about some of those high, those other high points. You know, we talked about your book, which which got to number three in the self help category on Amazon. We've talked about these podcasts. We've talked about, you know, th- th- some of the highlights of your life today. But I want to talk about setbacks. What is one specific setback that you feel was a setup to get where you are today, and why? Oh, let's see. I would have to say, um, you know, actually, kind of when you and I met, the position I was in at the time, the job that I took at the time, was the absolute worst job I have ever had in my life. And I hated every minute of it. You probably remember the whining and complaining I did. I think I did it like vocally on on Chris and Curtis. I blocked, blocked out that period of my <laughs> life, actually, Mark. <laughs> Surprised we made it right past that. No, I'm no, just kidding. I, uh, you know, I, I take my whole beginning of my career was, you know, plagued with just taking the next thing that came along. And in doing that, I had taken a job uh, working for a friend of mine. Um, who's still a friend, and, and I really like him, and he and I got along well, but about a year into that job, which, by the way, remember I said I didn't want to be a farmer? I was working in ag, making compost out of cow manure. So it's like, how did I get back here? So that was the first thing. Um, you know, but it got to the point, there was a manager that was hired, and he and I, you know, have you ever had somebody that you just do not get along? Like, no matter what you do, you don't get along with this person? Or is that just me? Uh, once, once or 75 okay, times. Good. Yeah. I think we've all had that. Yeah. You know, I always joke about that. We've all had that manager. Yes. That we just, at, we think to ourselves, how did this person ever get into leadership? And I think right. we've all had that person. I've been that person. Right. I can believe You that. know, believe people that. know my, that will listen to this long enough or read my blog long enough. Just go to the leadership category. Go to mattmcwilliams.com, click on leadership, and probably 60 to 70% of the content is about essentially the following message. Here's how I sucked at this aspect of leadership. And then the positive is here's how I fixed it. Right. But it had to start with the here's how I sucked. And, and I think so many people read those things. And if you read, if you read 20 of the posts in a row, you'll think, my goodness, how did this guy not get killed? Like, how did one of his employees not kill him? <laughs> but if you read individual aspects, you go, yep, that's me. Yeah. You know, cause we all have, we all have aspects of those bad leadership qualities. I just had all 20 of them. 
Right. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we've all had that, that leader, and I've been that leader. Okay, go ahead. Continue. So anyways, I mean, I was completely miserable. I mean, the guy, I mean, he every every time he turn, we turned around, he would try to, you know, dictate what I was supposed to be doing. And this was after I'd had a year of pretty much virtually freedom. I mean, I could do whatever I want. I could start work whenever I wanted. I could leave if I needed to. And, and he basically shut all that down. And look at the time, I mean, I was so miserable. I mean, I was working 75 hours a week, um, never saw my family. Uh, I was making quite a bit of money on overtime. But other than that, it pretty much sucked. Um and just completely miserable. But I look back now, and that I actually, you know, taking a book from your uh, or a, a page from your book, Matt. About a year after I left, I I wrote the guy a, a thank you note and told him that without him, I wouldn't have got to where I was, um, because it it led me to um, being offered another job, which led to the job I have now, um, which gave me the time to do the things that I do now. So you know, if if I had, I'm one of those people. If I would have been comfortable, I probably never would have left. You know, I would have hated it, and it wouldn't have been what I wanted to be doing, but I might still be there today. It would have taken me a long time to actually move on um, because I was making a lot of money. I mean, I was making a ton of overtime, and so there wasn't enough. You know, that was a good part of it, I guess, so I wouldn't have been able to move on. So that was certainly probably my biggest setback is just taking a job that, that I had no business being in that I didn't like because of, you know, basically because of the money. Um, and, and seeing the ability and then and then getting stuck there. So I think that's probably the biggest setback I've had, and it certainly set me up for everything I have today. Um, and, and, you know, many of the relationships I have today lead directly out of um, me determining to leave that job and then meeting people because I left and, and started doing something else. So if I, if I hear you correct, if it hadn't have been for that experience, you probably, if you had settled in there, maybe it wasn't as bad as it was, and the money was still as good, and, and so you could you could justify it. Mm-hmm. That if you had settled in there, you probably you would not have stretched yourself. You would not have sought out the blogs. You would not have developed the relationships that you have today, and you would probably be still stuck in that mediocre, not crappy job. Oh, it was crappy, medi- mediocre. Job. I worked with Calvin. No, no, I worked I'm with saying, It was crappy, literally. <laughs> leave it to I'm you, just Mark. Saying. Leave it to you. I literally had a crappy say. job. Oh, okay. Right. Which is a perf- which is a perfect segue because I want to talk about a little ebook that you and I did together. Yeah. But 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 basically, let's just say that that job was mediocre. Mm-hmm. Again, it wasn't your life's fulfillment. You weren't loving it, but the money was good. Odds are you would not have reached out and you would not have, you know have participated in Chris Licurdo's blog or other blogs and developed the network that you have today. Is that correct? Yes, at the very, very best, I would be years behind where I am now. At worst, yeah, okay. I'd still be there. And so that setback, that this monumentally awful time of your life, thankfully became a catalyst to where you are today. Yes, that was still a, that's awesome. That was a hard thank you note to write, but I did write it to him. I did not hear back from him, by the way. That's not the point. I know. Many, many times, I know. I, I, you know. <laughs> Without going down the trail of talking about thank you notes too much, you know, so many times the point of a thank you note, we're we're writing Who's one. Uh, there's a there's a, a store here, and you know, we have them in the Midwest called Meyer. Uh, I don't. Most of the listeners probably you know, outside of the Midwest have never heard of Meyer, but Meyer is basically like uh, it's a hybrid of Target and Walmart. It's it's just a classier Walmart. Sorry, Walmart. It's just nicer. And um, is this different than Fred Meyer, or is it the same thing? I, Fred Meyer is a jeweler, I believe. No, it's a full store out here. Oh, is it? Yeah. Well, I don't know. No, I I don't think it is. It's a combination it's, between Target and Walmart, really. Okay. Well, maybe that. Maybe <laughs> it is. This. Maybe they changed the name out there. I don't know. But Meyer. We need to investigate this. this. This great store here. Okay. Pretty, you know, pretty good store. And we had the other night. We had the absolute best, single best checkout person I've had in my 35 years on Earth that I can remember. And her name was Kia, mm-hmm. K-E-A. So hopefully somebody maybe knows the Kia at the Lima Road, Meyer in <laughs> Fort Wayne, Indiana. If you do, seriously, give her a big pat on the back. In this particular case where we're writing a thank you note to her at Meyer, I'm doing that for her. I want her manager to see that note. Right. You know, but so many of the times we're writing thank you notes for us, just like oh, you yeah. know, like you said, yeah. I I I wrote one to my stepmom who there were some issues with my dad when he passed away and I didn't appreciate some things, but I did write to her and say, Hey, thanks for caring for my dad through his, you know, through his disease. I didn't want to write that. And I didn't write it 
for her. I wrote it for me because if I didn't write a thank you note per se, <laughs> I probably wasn't going to ever get past that bitterness right. that I had. So it sounds like the, the same oh, yeah. thing for you. And I love that. Yep. So it doesn't matter if he didn't respond. The fact is he got it and maybe it changed how he felt about stuff. That's, that's what I hope. Right. Agreed. Um, so you've, you've, you've got out, you've been in a position where you had a job that you absolutely hated. Mm -hmm. Um, do you find, I mean, just, do you find that it's hard to change the world to, to do the things that you've been called to do when you just hate your job? Yes, <laughs> I would say yes. Um, and, and I don't think it's, you know, for me, a lot of it was the time thing. Uh, but even more than that, I think when you're in a, a position that you absolutely abhor, it takes so much mental energy to just be there. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. It's, exhausting. Yeah, it's physically yeah. and mentally exhausting, you know. I, I would get halfway through Sunday and start, you know, literally getting sick to my stomach, not wanting to go to work the next day. And so when you're doing that, I mean, you know, it takes you a half a day to wind down after being at work. It takes you a half a day, you know, away from you just getting ready for work again. You really don't have much time left for yourself or your family. So, yeah, it's exhausting. Now, that being said, I don't think it's impossible. And, and I think my mindset probably wasn't correct. I think if somebody's in that position, then you could make huge differences and and you still could make a difference. But me at that time, I was not in the mindset to do so. And I think it is a lot harder either way. Yeah. I mean, it, it's absolutely exhausting. I I've told this story so many times how when I, my last job, the, the last time I will ever work for someone and have a boss was, I was so miserable that our Friday night date nights, we take a date night every Friday night as a family we go to a local restaurant and then we either, depending upon how late it is, we'll go do something fun like putt putt or, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. We'll just go hang out, go to a, sometimes we just go do our shopping for the weekend. You know, it just depends on what we're doing, but we at least sit down for a meal that we don't have to cook for an hour and just enjoy each other's time as a family. But for the previous 10 weeks, Friday night, date night had become Matt complains about his job night. <laughs> <laughs> and I could tell this was exhausting for my wife because I'd been on the receiving end of that. I'd been on the Friday night, date night was Tara complains about her job night. And this right. is when I loved my job. But now we had switched roles. And finally, she looks at me on a Friday night and says, basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what she said. I'm giving you an ultimatum. You either quit your job. And we need to set a deadline. So end of year, that's two months from now, you need to have a new job by the end of the year or I'm leaving. <laughs> you know, And I don't think it was that strong, but thankfully, this you know, talk about setbacks. It's one of those things that was such a blessing. The next day I got fired. Nice. <laughs> I got fired the next day on a Saturday morning, the day on my way practically to the office to update my resume <laughs> and um to work and I got fired which is the best thing that ever happened to me and yeah it's 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 absolutely exhausting and I wasn't able to do anything right. extra I didn't have the freedom to just spend mm -hmm. time with my family I didn't have the freedom I never thought about writing a book until after I got fired I never thought about having a podcast until I got fired or writing a blog or being friends with Mark Sievercrop the great Mark Sievercrop until I got fired all that stuff happened post getting fired so I know someone is listening. I know there's somebody listening right now. They hate their job. The statistics are there. Um, I think you've sh you shared the statistics. Speaking of that ebook that we'll talk about in a minute, I know that someone is listening who hates their job. So let's talk about how you left that job that you hated. What were the steps that you took to get to to find work that you love? Well, I think looking back now, um, and the one thing I would say to somebody that's in that position, it will change quicker than you think it will. Um, you know. Every time I've seen somebody that completely hates their job, you feel like it's going to go on forever, and it's not going to. You know, whether it's like you, Matt, where you get fired, or me, where I just quit one Friday, um, it it changes very quickly. And the the good thing about being in a horrible job is, it's not real hard to get to something better um, and and make a big difference. But I think the biggest thing I did, the two things that I I look back and I did was. One, I was learning. I was always learning. I was fortunate. Um, as much as I hated my job, I was fortunate to have a job where, you know, 14, 16 hours a day, I was all by myself. So I listened to podcasts. You know, I listened to ebooks. I listened to audiobooks. I, I did all those things. And so I was always learning and I was always growing. And that's the time that, you know, you and I met, Matt. I mean, I had all this time sitting on this machine that literally went in a, a mile an hour. That's how fast it went, turning compost. And I would just sit and read blogs and I would sit and listen to podcasts and I would do all these things that 
really put me in a position to be able to move forward later on, even though I didn't know how that was going to work. The second thing I did, and kind of tied to that first one, is I started building relationships. Um, I started meeting people and, and really, you know, finding people that could encourage me. You know, we, we've mentioned meeting on a blog a few times. I mean, it was it was Chris Licurdo's blog, and, and there's, what, probably eight to ten of us that still are in constant contact with each other. I mean, we always talk, and, and some of my very best friends are some of those people, um, you being one, Lily being another. You know, we, I've met all these people that literally have changed my life. Um, so those were the two things I think that got me out of that position. I learned things, I, I got some knowledge, but more importantly, I got some support and I got people that were willing to encourage me when I needed encouraged and people that were able to kick me in the butt when I needed to be kicked in the butt and to move on and do something that I knew I needed to do. Um, so I think those were the big things and I think those are the big things for anybody that's in that position is continue learning, continue looking forward and trying to uh, move forward and and build relationships. Strength, you know, create some relationships and develop some relationships that will um, allow you to have that support that you need. So, building that network in advance was obviously a big key. Yes, you had that. You had that safety net when you did leave. Obviously, you had. If I'm not mistaken, you did have another job already lined up, or or no? Um, kind of. <laughs> Kind of. <laughs> the kind way it of. happened okay. was I, I got in an argument with my boss on uh, Friday, went home, told my wife, I'm done, I'm quitting, I am not going back there. She goes, you can't, you don't have another job. So I started calling friends of mine, found a friend that uh, owns a tree co- or company that trims trees, said, hey, do you need some work? He goes, yeah, I could use somebody for a week. <laughs> and so came back to my wife, said, I've got a job for this coming week. And I uh, took the pickup back that I had for work on a Saturday, Sunday night and uh, texted him and told him I was done. So kind of I had a job lined up only because my wife insisted that I do so um but then it I mean it worked out and I ended up getting an offer for a a full-time job that Thursday of that week um so yes and no (laughs) yeah well you know and, and the lesson the lesson to anybody listening because for me when I got fired I had you know the reason I ended up getting into consulting is I actually did seek out another full-time job I wasn't thinking about becoming a a full-time consultant or having my own business, writing a blog, writing books, having a podcast. I got fired and immediately said, okay, I need to find another job. And I had such a powerful network and such a, you know, such relationships with so many people that I had so many offers. I couldn't say yes to any one of them. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, I couldn't say no to any one of them. So I said yes to a bunch of them and I was able to work out a deal with multiple companies to do, you know, part-time consulting basically. Right. And I think that's the power of that network is when I got fired, I sat down, I got fired at 10 a.m. on a Saturday. I had a couple of errands to run. And by 1 p.m. that day, I parked my butt on the couch for the next four hours and fired off emails to about 200 people saying, Hey, I just wanted, I wanted you to be the first to know. I wanted you to hear from me that today was my last day at this company, blah, blah, blah. If you know of anybody looking for somebody with my skills, you know, I don't remember exactly what I wrote, but that day I was firing off emails to almost 200 people by Monday or Tuesday of the following week. So within 96 hours of being fired, I had job offers. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I mean, it was like, there was no loss there. It was, I don't even, I don't even remember being unemployed really. You know, it just didn't even exist in my mind. And and so that was for me, that was that powerful thing. And it sounds like it was similar for you. And, and the lesson that I, I give people is, you know, you know, the, you know, the statement we've all heard your net worth or your network is your net worth. Mm-hmm. But it truly is when you need a job or when you set out to chase your dream or to do what you've been called to do, what you're passionate about, you need that powerful network. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, you know, obviously that's kind of what I talk about a lot, but yeah, I mean, the most important thing in my life has been the relationships I've built. Um, you know, you mentioned all of those things that I've done. I look back and, and really my most important and my biggest accomplishments, I think, are some of the people that I've been able to build relationships with. Um, and, and I strongly believe that if you don't have the things you want in your life, if you haven't achieved the things you want to achieve, you're, you're really just a few key relationships away from being able to do that. And, and the trick is finding those relationships and and, um, you know, nurturing them and, and helping them grow. But yeah, I mean, that's the biggest part. So if you're one of those people out there, we, we've, I've touched on it a few times. I mentioned this ebook. 
if you're one of those people out there and you're like, you know, I think I have a crappy job. But I'm not but I'm sure. not sure. You know, I mean, like, I know that I know this isn't what I I don't want to be doing this 20 years from now, but maybe I could withstand it for the next four or five years. And maybe you haven't quite ruined your date nights with your family by talking about how crappy your job is. Mark and I wrote a, a little ebook. I, I want to say it's maybe Mark. What do you remember? Like five or six pages. It's just a it's yeah, a it's quick, quick read. It's called the Eight Signs You Have a Crappy Job, and and what to do about it. And so we put that together. You can get that again. The URL for today's show, if you go to mattmcwilliams.com forward slash zero three three, access to all the show notes, and you can grab that free book, Eight Signs You Have a Crappy Job and What to Do About It, that Mark and I put together for you. So. That's what to do. Uh, that's the answer right there. If you if you hate your job or think you hate your job or you're not even sure if you hate your job or you maybe you love your job and you want to start hating it. I don't know. Uh, it's kind of, it's kind of <laughs> funny too. So even if you just want to laugh, there's some humor. Yeah, it, it's it's uh, that all comes from Mark, by yes. the way. None of none of the humor is is my doing. No, man, it's not funny at all. No, I'm not. So. <laughs> so speaking of segues about not being funny, no. Yeah. Um, is there is there because I love to share these with the audience. Is there a particular person in your past, or maybe a book or a quote that you've you've lived by that inspired you to to reach for greatness? Oh, geez, you just asked like four questions, and I could answer each one of them differently. But um, pick pick one. Of, well, let's pick one person or a book or a quote. Ah, fine. Um, if you're gonna make me choose, really the the book that has really got me to where I am today. Um, and if I, if you were to ask me two years ago, I would have said Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Love that book. However, since then, I have read a book that, Matt, I know you're reading right now uh, because I sent it to you, um, The Power of Starting Something Stupid. And I'm going to roll these all into one because that book and the author, Richie Norton, um, are the ones that really have changed the way I look at things. And, and if you have not read that book, your audience, you know, if you haven't read that book, I would strongly recommend you read that book. Um, and I know, I think, Matt, you, you're going to have Richie on at some point, right? Or I, have you already? I certainly am. <laughs> I certainly am. Um, but that book is so full, and I know you know you and I were talking about this a couple of days ago, but it's so full of actionable advice. I mean, it's all about start doing it now. And it literally, I can trace back pretty much everything that I have done in the last two years to reading that book, literally, and probably 80% of the relationships I've built. And it's all because of one quote. And this doesn't even come from the book, but when I was fortunate enough to interview Richie on the Happy to Your Career podcast, and he said one thing that I always come back to, and I've always shared this with people. He said this one, and I don't even think he really meant it as being that big of a deal, but he just kind of said it off the cuff. He said, magic happens when you're in motion. And that is so true, and it's, it's made such a huge impact in my life that if I want something to happen in my life, I need to be in motion. I need to be doing something, and I need to be taking the next step. And the times that I do that is the times that I move forward. And the times that I don't do that are the times that I whine and complain and feel like everything sucks. So that would be the book and the person, I think, that have really inspired me and encouraged me. You know, I've had the, the great opportunity and the, the fortune to, to talk with Richie several times since and um, consider him a friend now, which just blows my mind that I'm friends with this guy that wrote the book that changed my life. But um, that would be the book or the, the person that, that really has changed my life. Wow, that was actually one of the best. <laughs> That's the only time I think anybody's ever been able to tie all three of those together. So you started with the book, Boom. the power of power of, power of starting something stupid, which you're right. I'm about two thirds of the way through now, and it's awesome. I don't think that there have been very few books I've highlighted more than this book. I will say that. And, and so obviously the person who wrote it, who you've now become friends with, Richie Norton, who has a quote, not from the book, <laughs> which is, uh, let me see here, magic happens when you're in motion. Yep. Is that correct? That correct? Magic happens when you're in motion. And that's so true. I mean, that goes back to exactly what you talked about, about starting. Mm -hmm. You know, you were in motion by, okay, I'm just going to read some blogs. I don't know where else to start. There's no book out there that says... You know, what do you do when you have a job that pays really well, but, you know, the hours are long and, you know, I'm not really. So, like, what's my next step? Well, there, there's so many things. They'll say, well, update your resume and start submitting it to websites like monster.com. Right. It's terrible advice. You know, I mean, everybody knows this. No great job has ever been. Uh, nobody's ever got a great job by submitting their resume. That's that's. I'm not trying to diminish these jobs, but that's how you get a job in the fast food industry. That's right. how you get a job 
doing stuff that's not what you love to do. You get jobs that you love through relationships. Right. I literally, in my entire life, I'm 35 years old, I've never gotten a job by submitting a resume. I don't even know if I've ever submitted a resume. I think maybe back when I was like a kid I did, but I, I've never done that. I've, it's always been so-and-so knows so-and-so who knows so-and-so who gets me a job. Right. You know, and that was back when I was 18 years old, and it's the same today. That's how I get clients. I get clients strictly from referrals. But, you know, I, I love how you tied that all in, and that magic really does happen when you're in motion, when you're doing things, because when you're doing things, it gives you the opportunity to do things poorly. Right. And when you do things poorly, you learn from it. And it also gives you the opportunity to do things well and to have those successes. Right. Well, and the thing I've learned, too, is is doing things poorly. I heard somebody say this the other day. I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been David Ralph on his uh, podcast, but made the comment that when you start off, nobody's paying attention to you, and what a blessing that is, yep. you know, um, and that's so true, and that's what I had to get over. You know, you and I had this conversation a while back, and, and the exact same thing. I, I tried something. It didn't go very well, and it's like, well, that's okay. At least you can fix it. Nobody noticed. <laughs> So, I mean, it, it really is just being in motion, and, and it's the only way you're going to learn some of the things you need to learn. It's the only way you're going to get to some of the things that you need to get to in your life is just by taking that next step. And, and you're right. you know, I could have taken a lot bigger steps. I could have updated my resume. I could have done all those things. But to me, the biggest step I took was just listening to something, just reading something. And you know, for anybody that thinks it's too big of a change, find the smallest thing you can do and do that. And when you do that, then you'll get to the next step and the next step and the next step. But you have to be in motion before you'll notice what that next step is. Mm. I love that. Are you, eating, are you eating something over there? What was that? Mm. <laughs> mm. This sandwich is good. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> that was me. I was I was uh, chewing on your words. Oh, okay. <laughs> As a cow chews on his cud, Fair I was I was ruminating on your words gotcha. there, Mark. Fair enough. But that, that is powerful what you said because you worked on yourself first. Yeah. You know, by, by listening to the Chris Licardo podcast and listening to or reading his blog and reading the other blogs, you weren't really looking for those quick tips on how to get out of a crappy job and how to find the better one and how to improve my career in three easy steps. You know, you're like you were working on yourself and and you were in a way you were passively doing it because like you said, you were doing it while the manure machine was going at one mile per hour. Mm hmm. But at the same time, you were actively doing it. Yeah. I love yep. that. So so you mentioned another author. You mentioned Richie Norton. We've talked about his book. We talked about the book that you know you and I did together, the quick ebook. It was really more of a, a report more right. than anything. I don't even know if I'd call it an ebook. But I want to talk about your book because okay. it's uh, you know, Project Success, because it did. It reached number three on the Amazon in the Amazon Kindle store, which is no small feat. Yeah. But I want to talk about the co the concept of that book. You know, these this is doing projects and how how do how do projects ultimately help people change the world? Well, at the uh, at the risk of making making this the Richie Norton show, um, it's a it's a concept I learned from that book, uh, from the power of starting something stupid, and and I just expanded upon it. But basically, the idea is the fact that really what we've just been talking about that some things are so big that you don't know where to start, and you're scared to death to start them. And and I always joke that. Um, you know, that's the way I am. I get an idea and I go from my garage to a Fortune 100 company in 2.6 seconds. And then I don't know what to do because I don't know where to get a corporate jet. And so why even start? You know, why even make a, why even, why make a business plan, Matt? Because I don't know how I'm going to get the corporate jet or who I'm going to get to fly this stupid thing. So what projects do is they allow you to kind of bypass those mental roadblocks that keep you from doing things. The thing I found is I was looking through all of the reasons that I didn't do things and, and talking to other people. Most of the time, it's not a pro an actual problem that stops us from doing what we want to do. It's the thought of the problem. Yeah. You know, it, it's just thinking that something might happen that stops us, not it actually happening. You know, if it actually happens, we could adjust and move on, but we stop ourselves just by thinking of what could happen. Well, I don't know what I'll do if, if this happens, or I don't know what I'll do if this happens. I'm, I'm famous for this even still after writing the book. I still do this all the time. It's like, well, I don't want to do, uh, I don't want to do a phone call with uh, – invite people on a phone call because I don't know what I'm going to do after that. You know, I don't have everything set up. I don't know what to do. Well, you just have to start. So the idea of a project is that you have a beginning and an end date, and you say, I'm going to be doing this for three months. 
and this is what I want to happen at the end of it. And at the end of it, I'm going to stop and I'm going to see if I like what I was doing, if it worked, if there's anything I would change. And it saves you from feeling like a failure, you know, because that's something I've done over and over in my life. I've done something for a while. It wasn't what I ended up wanting to do or like doing, and I quit. And then I feel like a failure. You know, I, I feel like everybody's judging me as a failure because, oh, that's that thing you used to do, but you just stopped doing it or you quit doing it. And then that affects your mentality on everything you do going forward. Whereas if you do a project, you get to the end of it, you take a look at it and you say, no, that's not, you know, I, I finished it. So I'm a success. I finished. And now I don't want to do it anymore. I want to move on and I want to do another project. And, and that's something, um, you know, Matt, by the time this comes out, that um, will be common knowledge with happen in your career. You know, Scott and I did that exact thing. We had this project for a year and a half. Um, we worked together and we got to the point where we just said, hey, we need to reevaluate this. Is this what we need to be doing? Is, should we change it? And we made the decision that we needed to go separate ways. And I'm now focusing more on my blog. I'm focusing more on what I'm doing. Um, but it was that exact mentality of we didn't fail because we finished what we said we were going to do. We were at a stopping point. We reevaluated, and then we decided that we wanted to go do something else. And so rather than being a failure, I'm a success because I finished it and I consciously chose to try to do something else or move on to do something else. And that's that's the power of it. You know, you're not locked into something for the next 20 years because you decide that you're going to try it for three months, six months, maybe a year if it's like a job or something. And then you make the decision at the end of it whether you want to continue doing it as you are, change it a little bit and continue doing it, or go on and do something else. And that's okay. Because you're consciously making that decision, and that's the power of a project is is really getting past those roadblocks and those challenges that we put in front of ourselves. You know, I never thought of it, but uh, we're recording this two days after I just finished my second half marathon, and I I, I, just, I never thought of that half marathon as a project, but it really was because that that process was was a was a self discovery in a way because I finished. In fact, I finished 19 minutes faster than I did last year, which isn't saying much because that's my wife said basically the first year I ran in place for much of the race. Um, <laughs> it was like I, I ran most of my first half marathon against a treadmill going like two miles per hour. That's my excuse. But Wait, is Matt going backwards now? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. If I had stood still, I would have gone backwards probably. <laughs> but anywho, I you know I ran my second one and, I, and I, I never thought of it, but I did kind of view it as a project because – my goal was to complete the race. Right. I didn't have I had a time in mind, but it wasn't like a definitive time and, and I wasn't trying to place and you get a medal just for finishing. I wasn't going to win, you know. I'm an hour and 20 minutes behind the winners. Right. What am I talking about? But now what that project has done is I've said, okay, so there were two results. One, I hate running. Two, I love running. And and really, those are probably the only two directions I was going to go. And if I hate running, then I need to find something else to keep in physical shape. Right. You know, I need to find other objectives. Like, okay, I need to get in a basketball league or something. Right. But what I found out instead was I love running. And so now I'm thinking, okay, how do I get faster at half marathons? What 5Ks? What 10Ks? What marathons can I sign? You know, that's my next thing. I'm signing up for races left and right because I found through the process of this project that I actually love it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's very similar for so many people. We just, we say, okay, I'm going to do this one thing and we define there is no success or failure. The only failure I guess would have been if I just didn't complete the race. Right. But that probably wasn't going to happen. I might've completed it very slowly, right? but I was going to complete it unless I injured myself, you know? But here, here's the thing too, is the fact that, um, you know, even if you hadn't finished it, you would have done more than you would have if you hadn't planned on doing it. And that that's the beauty of starting a project, I think. You know, I, I, I wrote a post about this, oh my goodness, probably a year and a half ago on my blog. I'm not even sure where you would find it, and I'm not going to look it up while I'm talking <laughs> to you. But I would imagine if you go look up the term, if you go to mattmcwilliams.com and search half marathon, I haven't written that many posts about a half marathon. So and the, 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 the gist of this post was that if you just start that process, that for me, what I, I said, what, what were the worst case scenarios? Like, what if, I, what if I ran 11 miles? Great. And then I cramped up and I had to limp the last two miles. What if I did this? What if I puked? What if I, you know, what if I didn't beat my time last year? What if I, blah, I could have come up with all these excuses. Right. And the reality was when you train for a half marathon and you run, four miles on Monday and five miles on Wednesday and eight miles on Saturday. And then the following week, you know, you repeat the same thing and you increase your mileage. The reality is 
when I look back over the past four months, five months, I ran more miles in those four or five months than I'd run in any single year in my entire life. Mm-hmm. That is a success. I'm in better shape than I've been since, uh, I'm in better shape than I've been since college almost. Right. You know, I've still got a long ways to go to hit my, my fitness goals, but I'm at least in, I'm in, in good a shape as I've been in 10 years. And I love this thing of, of running. I just, I, it's, I get, I truly do get a runner's high every, like if I just run to the mailbox, I get a runner's <laughs> high now. You know, I'm like, woohoo, yep. endorphins. I feel that. You know, yep. and I'll, I'll like keep running. I'm in dress shoes and, you know, in a <laughs> shirt and tie. And I just keep running up the road through traffic, you know, because I get that runner's high. So, right. I, yeah, you're right. There, There is no, there's really no win or lose or pass or fail or, or any of that stuff. It's, it's, it's all a win when you yeah. start a project, even if you, even if the goal that you, you don't actually hit the goal that you're, yeah. you're set out to hit. It's all moving I forward. I love that. That's, I mean, it's, it's moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. So Mark, let's, you know, we've talked a lot about the present. We've talked a, a little bit about your past. I want to skip ahead to the future. I want you to put on, I want you to hop into your DeLorean and we're going to go, you know, five, 10, 15 years in the future. It's not as fun as going back to the wild, wild west. I know, (laughs) but what does, what do you think the future holds for you? The world changer that you are, Mark? Um, you know, I, I, I see it just, I, I I look at things in, in the, in the frame of relationships, I guess. So for me, it's, it's knowing more people. It's, It's getting to know people that, um, right now, it just seems unbelievable I would get to know. And it's not just so I can say that I know them. It's because it's because that I've built relationships and I've helped these people. I've, I've added value. So for me, a lot of it is who I know and how, how well I know them and how well I'm able to, you know, help them. And, you know, it's influencing other people's life and helping them to have those types of relationships and have those um, build that network that allows them to do whatever it is they want to do because everybody has different things that they want to do. But it's those relationships, again, that are going to help you do them. And so I see myself, you know, interacting with people and connecting with people and helping them to um, make those relationships and, and add value to people's lives. And I'm going to do that a lot of different ways. I, I, I totally expect to write another book. I expect to um, do some different courses and, and work with people and projects and, and, and just do all sorts of things. But really it's going to center around um, helping people build relationships and, and develop relationships that will help them move forward in their lives. I love that. And and speaking of the future, what I'm thinking ahead to that fateful day, hopefully 70 years from now, when you leave this earth, what legacy do you want to leave? Um, I think, you know, when I think of legacy, the biggest thing I think about is my family. I, I mean, that's what I always come back to. And, and I think it's having this legacy of being there for my kids and being around them and, and letting them know that they're the most important thing because I have the schedule and the time and the ability to focus on them, to be around them. Um, and beyond that, I think it's, it's helping other people find what's most important to them and achieve it, you know, and be able to do those things that they want to do. Um, that's the legacy that I want to leave. I want to, I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good father. I want to uh, be a good friend. You know, I, I love the fact that I know so many people and I love the fact that, that I'm always meeting more people and developing relationships with them. So you know, it's one of those, you know, people talk about what would what would your funeral be like? You know, what would your uh, memorial service be like? And, and I want there to be thousands of people. And it's not because I'm egotistical. It's because that means I've affected that many lives and I've made a difference. And, and that's really what my goal is, to make a difference, whatever that means. Some people, it's going to be something big. Other people, it might just be that I call them every once in a while and said hi and cared about them when nobody else did. And, and that's really the legacy I want to leave. But personally, I think that it is because you're egotistical, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with wanting to have that kind of a funeral. You know, I think yeah. back to my dad. You know, I, I was just thinking about this recently because I just went back to North Carolina, my, my to my hometown in North Carolina, and and I was thinking back to his funeral. And my dad's, you know, most people listening to this have never heard of Kevin McWilliams. Most people listening to this, you know, prior to this, me saying that name right now, that don't know of, you know, my dad. There are a few people listening who are personal friends who know about my dad, but most people don't know him. And you certainly have never seen him on TV. He's he's never authored a book. He never hosted a radio show or a podcast. And he was just content to, to be Kevin. Mm-hmm. And yet there were nearly 500 people at his funeral. And so, uh, you know, and I think back and they all had a Kevin McWilliams story. Right. 
I think that's a powerful legacy to leave. Well, and I, and I think, you know, as you were talking about that, I started thinking of all the funerals that I could have gone to but didn't. And for me to actually go to somebody's funeral, there has to be a story. There has to be a personal connection. I'm not just going to go because I knew the person necessarily. There has to be an actual reason that I cared about that person, not just we worked together or, you know, we knew each other for a long time. It, it really is because you've made an impact in that person's life. And that's exactly why, you know, I have that goal. And that's why I would would love to have that many people because it means I made an impact more than just I knew that person. So for all of you listening that Mark knows, if he doesn't come to your funeral, you'll know why. That's right. <laughs> and if you're not at mine, well, I probably won't care. But. <laughs> <laughs> Nor will I. Uh, so, hey, before I let you go, bud, give the audience one last piece of advice. I always like to leave... With that, that one thing, you know, pe- people are going to listen to this episode on, on a Friday and then it's or a Saturday or a Sunday. They're going to listen to it over a weekend and then the work week hits them. And so I like to give people that one thing they can do quickly, you know, next 24 to 72 hours, that one thing they can do today or tomorrow that will help them to change the world. Um, if I was to pick one thing that you could do today or tomorrow, I would say think of the people that you've met recently and find one or two that you have not reached back out to and do that. Because, you know, like we talked about, relationships are so important. And that's really what's going to move your life forward. And the right relationships will help kick you in the butt to get going. Um, you know, that was going to be my other tip I thought about was, you know, just start something. But if you find the right people, the right relationships, they will help you do that. So I would say reach out to somebody that you haven't talked to in a while and just start that conversation again. And if you do that, you'll be able to um, to grow those relationships and, and get the things that you want in your life and, and get moving on those goals. You know, I, I think back to the, the book you mentioned earlier, The Power of Starting Something Stupid. And, you know, the great thing about having those powerful relationships, those mastermind groups or, you know, like the relationship like you and I have mm-hmm. is you get two valuable things out of them. You, you get people who will truly tell you when something really is too stupid to do. Right. <laughs> you know, I think we, we went through that recently. It wasn't the, the, you know, that one of us had a, a stupid idea. It was just, well, why are you doing that? It's, it's, it's a great <laughs> idea, but how does that fit into your, your model? And the answer is, I don't know. Okay. So, Maybe it doesn't. So, so if you're going to bring that up, though, I have to point out the fact that you did say, I rarely disagree with you, and I completely called BS on it. So just well, remember that. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that was your line. I rarely disagree with you, but I do here. And I'm like, B.S., disagree with me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But in addition to proving the things that are truly stupid, or really just, again, it's not about being stupid. It's that they don't fit into your right. your calling in life. The second thing is they'll tell you when something might be a little bit stupid, but, hey, go ahead and try it. Right. And here's here's a way you can do that. And I think, you know, so those networks, those connections, those masterminds are valuable from a standpoint of not only talking you down from doing something you'll regret, but also pushing you to do something that you probably won't regret, but you might not be successful at, but who cares? Well, the interesting thing is when you first meet somebody, you don't realize they're that person. You'll never know when it's that person at first. So the key is just certainly never thought I would be mine, Mark. Dang it. He beat me to the punchline. (laughs) No, that's, that's that's why I interrupted you because I knew you would say that about me first. For example, no, but so that's why I say you know find those people that you've met recently and reach out to them. And until you've had a few conversations with them, you're not going to know who you're going to connect with and click with, and and that there'll be that person. So the key is just to meet a lot of people and get to know a lot of people, and and some of them will rise to the top, and some of them will end up being the people that you talk to all the time. And you know I completely agree with you, Matt. You know two years ago I never thought. You know, you and I would talk all the time and, and that you'd be one of the people that I bounce ideas off of all the time. But that just kind of naturally happens when you're just out meeting people. So, um, again, that's why I say to, to just, you know, find those people you've already met and, you know, touch bases with them again. Mm-hmm. The more people you meet, the more awesome people you meet. Yes. So, Mark, before I let you go, this is this is your your chance to just share a call to action with the audience. You know, how, how can people find you? Where do you want this world changer audience to go after they listen. It's in addition to the show notes page, which again, you can find at mattmcwilliams.com forward slash zero three, three for episode 33. Where can people find you? Well, there's a tree where we make cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. Uh, no, there, there's a lot of different places that you're an elf. I'm an elf. According to that, <laughs> uh, if you uh, go to Twitter, S crop two, S K R O P P two, probably one of the best ways to get a hold of me. 
Um, I'm always interested on podcasts too. I love when people leave their email address and I would do the same. Um, love to connect with people. So Mark at Severcrop.com. I uh, love to, to chat with you and, and get to know you a little bit better. Um, and also Matt, I do, uh, we'll have a, a, um, special page for your listeners to get, um, all the stuff that I have on my site easily. So, um, I can give you that and you can put it on the show notes page and whatnot. But, um, just as a thank you for listening and, and allowing me to share my story a little bit. Excellent. Excellent. I look forward to that. And, and you're an angry elf, Mark. <laughs> oh boy. I laugh a lot. For those who, for those lot. who've never seen, seen the word or seen the movie elf, there's a scene <laughs> I'm thinking of when Will Ferrell walks into the conference room and he says, dad, I'm in love and I don't care who knows. And then he looks at this, the, the guy, I think his name is Peter Dinkler or something. Yeah. Uh, for, he was, uh, he was in, um, what was he? And not the, not the Hobbit, but, um, uh, Ah, Narnia. Yeah. The, the dwarf in Narnia. And he looks at him and he goes, oh, does Santa know you're here? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, we're all laughing. We're really, we are deep inside. He wasn't really. And impressed. then uh, he says, call me an elf one more time. <laughs> so he does. <laughs> you're, an, you're an elf. <laughs> he just, char- oh, that's awesome. When he drop kicks him. Anywho. The yeah. Oh, it's great. Listen, guys, he's <laughs> closing this up here. <laughs> Before this becomes the Mark and Matt movie hour, he's passionate about connecting with others. He's helping others to find their true passion through the power of networking. And he is wise for starting something stupid. He's Mark Sievercrap, y'all. Mark, you are a world changer. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks, Matt. You're an elf. I don't even know what to say. I'm keep I'm Done. keeping that in. I, I know you are. That's why I'm laughing. Wow, that was <laughs> that was fun to go back and listen to. You know, it's been it's been almost ah uh, shoot almost a year since we recorded that Matt and I, and it's fun to go back and listen to uh, our conversation and the things we talk about and to see how things have changed for me. You know, personally, because now I'm working with Matt, I'm working full time with Matt. I'm the co-host of this show, obviously, and just to see, and all of those things happen because of the power of networking, like Matt and I talked about in the interview a year ago. You know, those things have just compounded for me, and I've found that it really is the things and the people that you know that really make the difference. So since Matt's not here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time recapping the episode. You heard it, uh, but it would be weird for me to sit and talk about how fantastic it was since it was an interview with me. But as we wrap up, we do have a book that we would like to give away. It's from our good friend, Matt and I's friend, Judy Robinette. And now, if you don't know who Judy is, she's an unbelievable connector. I mean, they talk about her having the titanium Rolodex, I think is what they call it. She knows everybody. It's crazy. The times I've talked to her, it's not name dropping, but she just knows people. And her book, How to Be a Power Connector, will help you learn how to develop a large network that you can count on when you need it, whether that's for getting a new job, whether that's for getting new clients, or whatever else it is in your life. This book can help you do it. It's How to Be a Power Connector, the 5 plus 50 plus 100 rule for turning your business network into profits. And here's the book. I don't know if you can see that. And if you would like to enter to win a free copy of this book, text CONNECTOR to 33444. Again, that's connector to 33444 for your chance to win a free copy of Judy Robinette's book, How to Be a Power Connector. Now, before we get into this week's question, as we always do, let's go ahead and thank a few of the folks who have left us ratings and reviews on iTunes. So today we have, let's see, we have six people today. We have Ruby McGuire. We have Dobby Mugabe, I hope I said that right. We have S.M. Hale, Emily Dilling, David is Batman. (laughs) Um, Now we know Batman's real name. Apparently it's not Bruce, it's David. David is Batman, Y is his name on here. And the last one, I love this name. The name of this last person is Every Freaking Name Taken. So apparently the name they wanted for their iTunes was Taken. And we want to point out real quick S.M. Hale's comments, which were really awesome. Uh, They say, people who love big picture thinking sometimes need help executing. 
and delegating the details. There's a lot of terrain between big idea and change the world, and this podcast helps fill in the map and provides great encouragement along the way. Well, thank you all for your, your reviews, those six. And if you have not left us a rating and review, the link to do so is on the show notes page right towards the bottom. It's on the show notes page at mattmcwilliams.com forward slash zero nine three. And again, if you want to win a free copy of the book, How to Be a Power Connector, the 5 plus 50 plus 100 rule for turning your business networks network into profits by Judy Robinette, text CONNECTOR to 33444. And now, today's question is, what one action have you delayed taking that you need to take today? Head on over to mattmcwilliams.com forward slash 093 to answer that question, as well as to get the links to everything that was talked about today in the interview, as well as the unedited video cast of this interview. Well, we don't have a video of the interviews. We did this long before you're we doing it. But the, the video of me doing this right now, um, head on over there and you get that there. On next week's episode, Matt talks with Jason Troy. Jason's the author of Social Wealth, and they talk about the importance of relationships, both personally and professionally. Take a listen to this clip. Until next week, remember, you were born to change the world. You were born to make history. You were born to take action on your dreams. So believe it, become it, and pass it on. Ooh, there we go. That was pretty fast, but uh, that's what happens when I don't have anyone else to talk to. There's nothing to review uh, from the, the interview, especially when when uh, it's my interview, and so I felt awkward talking about it. But um, as we said, um, for those of you that might be watching this, um, you can get a copy of that book, Judy Robinette's book, and we're going to be sprinkling in some of these interviews. We're going to have a few other um old interviews that did really well. We have number two and number one coming up in the coming weeks, so pay attention for those. Um, and uh, we're not gonna tell you who they are, but as, as the weeks go on, you'll find out, and we'll reshare those and uh, give you a chance to take a listen to those. So thanks so much for watching and listening, and uh, we will see you guys next week.